Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Public health has always been a key focus area for Bloomberg Philanthropies. We've launched major initiatives to tackle tobacco use, obesity, road safety, COVID-19, and many other challenges. So we are excited to welcome today's special guest and a leading public health champion, the director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis Collins. In a moment, he will join a conversation with the head of our public health programs, Dr. Kelly Henning. But before I hand things over to them, I will just say that Dr. Collins has been a true pioneer in his field, especially his work on the human genome, and we are lucky to have him in public service. As director of the largest biomedical research agency in the world, he's helping to lead the country's battle against COVID-19, while also overseeing other critical work and preparing us for the next crisis. Dr. Collins, thank you for joining us and for all your extraordinary work to protect and save lives. Now let me turn it over to Dr. Henning, who served as Director of Epidemiology at the New York City Health Department when I was mayor, and we were smart enough to hire her at our foundation. Kelly? Thank you, Mike. Thank you for that warm introduction. We know that vaccination is the strategy that we need to use to move ahead and to get beyond this COVID-19 pandemic, but we still have a lot of unanswered questions, questions about boosters, questions about variants, questions about children and their vaccination status. So we're so fortunate today to have Dr. Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, here with us to answer some of our questions. So let me just jump right in, Dr. Collins. Thank you again for being here. I think top of mind right now are booster shots. Um, everyone's talking about boosters. We're wondering who's gonna get them, when are they gonna get them, what will be the criteria to receive them? So I'm wondering if you could start us off with some more information about that topic. Well, I will try to do so. And it's nice to join you, Dr. Henning. And those were nice remarks from Mike Bloomberg uh, to kick this all off. I'm honored to have a chance to take part in this conversation. And yeah, it is a particularly auspicious moment to be talking about boosters, because at this very moment, CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, the ACIP, is meeting in a public session, being watched by tens of thousands of people, <laughs> including me, until we just started this interview, to try to see what their decision is going to be about boosters. <laughs> Now, this has been quite a week for that. Uh, last Friday, the FDA's advisory committee called VerbPAC did their deliberations about boosters. They looked at a lot of the data from the U.S. and from other places, particularly Israel, which is about three months ahead of the U.S. in terms of getting the initial vaccinations in place and then noticing that they are starting to wane in effectiveness over time. And so they began giving boosters initially to people over 60 on the last day of July, and then they extended that to younger groups as they went forward. So there's already data there. And without tipping my hand too much, I will say the data looks really impressive uh, that the boosters do in fact provide substantial reduction in infection, uh, like a tenfold reduction just within 12 days after that booster and also a reduction in severe illness, which is the thing we're most concerned about and which was starting to appear in people who hadn't gotten their vaccination as recently as you might like. So the folks who got immunized in January in Israel were the ones, especially those over 65, where you're starting to see serious cases, not just the sniffles. And those individuals also got a substantial improvement uh, with the booster and reducing their likelihood of severe disease by about 12 fold. So it was it was quite an impressive result. Obviously, um, CDC now with a FDA having come out and said this is recommendation from them to begin to offer boosters to everybody over 65 if they're six months or more away from their original immunization. And for younger groups, 18 to 64, if they had risk of medical complications because they had some previous medical comorbidity, those were also on the FDA list. And then also people at higher risk because of occupational or institutional exposure, thinking about healthcare providers, thinking about teachers in schools, they were also uh, given a nod by FDA. Now we'll see uh, whether CDC agrees with that. 
People may say this is a very strange and contorted process, but it's our process. And what it does make possible is for everybody who's interested to see the data and hear the debate in a public meeting and then understand how we came to the conclusion. And I think that's a really good thing. Dr. Collins, you make good points about the trend, um, about the ability of all of us to take a look and to be part of this debate. And I think that's an important point. One of the things that we're hearing about is Pfizer, a lot of a lot of Pfizer dis discussion. What does this booster discussion mean for people who've gotten Moderna or J&J? &J? Is there any mix and match strategy here? Or what do you think is going to happen with that situation? Well, yeah, a lot of people are wondering. Pfizer is a little ahead of Moderna and J&J &J in terms of having generated the data about boosters. So they submitted that data to FDA, and FDA has now studied it carefully. And Moderna is probably two or three weeks behind on that, and J&J &J likewise. So right now, today, the discussion that we're holding is just about Pfizer. And if you got Pfizer and they decide you're ready for a boost, you will get boosted with Pfizer. Now, everybody wants to know, well, wait a minute. We got three vaccines here. What about the rest of us? I'm one of those. I got Moderna. <laughs> what about me? Um, we are at NIH actually running right now a mix and match trial uh, where we take people who got any one of the three initial vaccinations and then boost them either with that one or one of the other two and look to see what happens. It's not a big trial, but it's enough to see, do you bump your antibody levels up uh, as well uh, if you go to a different uh, booster than you started with, or do you maybe even do better? And we don't have that data yet. Um, their data is coming pretty soon though. So be of good cheer, people. Uh, it's likely that we will know a lot more about that in the course of the next month or so. And Moderna has submitted their booster data, but FDA hasn't yet reviewed it. And J&J &J did just uh, a couple of days ago reveal some of their data, which I think they're submitting to FDA maybe uh, later this week. So it's all in the mix. And, you know, we have an abundance of good things here, uh, Kelly, because we have a circumstance where we were, you know, hopeful we'd get at least one vaccine that worked and we got three and that's good, but it means everything's a little out of sync at a time like this, we're pretty close, but not quite. So everybody keep calm, keep patient. Bottom line, I should have said at the beginning is, if you got the original immunizations, you're in very good shape still, even though we're a little worried about the deterioration and the effectiveness for people who got those doses back in January. They're still pretty darn good, even good against Delta. So there's no reason to panic or rush around and do something uh, until we really have all the data in front of us. That's that's really helpful. I, I I'm going to ask you to sort of use your crystal ball for a minute and and tell us, do you think that if we all do get recommended to receive boosters and we move forward, do you think this is going to be a recurring theme? We're going to need boosters every six months, every 12 months, every two years. Any thoughts on that? I wish my crystal ball was a little more reliable on this one because everybody wants to know the answer, but we just don't really know what to expect with this coronavirus because we've never really dealt with this thing before. There's a couple of ways that that answer might emerge. One may be just whether the vaccine itself holds up. Now that you've got that third dose, does that give you an even longer duration than we got from the first two? There are reasons to think that might be the case. Other vaccines like hepatitis, for instance, where you really get the long lasting immunity kind of requires three doses and to have them spaced out over at least six months. That's where your immune system really gets it and says, OK, I understand what I need to do from now on. So it could be that the third dose is going to have really nice long duration or not. We don't know. And the other big question, of course, is the variants. Delta has pretty much completely taken over the world's population of SARS-CoV-2 right now because it is so contagious and it has been so effective. But we don't know what's coming after that. And we do worry about a variant emerging that the vaccines might be less effective for than they are for what we've seen so far. And that might then be a reason for a booster, except in that case, the booster might need to be a vaccine that's redesigned to specifically go after that emerging variant. So far, we haven't had to do that. It's really quite reassuring that being boosted with the original vaccine, which was designed against the original virus, 
gives you a great boost in resistance to Delta. Your immune system is very clever about this. It doesn't just make very specific, tightly narrowed uh, antibodies against that one thing. It kind of covers uh, the range of spike proteins that might potentially have happened. That's turning out to be a really good bit of news. Just following up on that point, are there any other variants beyond Delta that you've got your eye on right now? Or how, I guess another question would be, how likely are we to be able to find other variants out there that we should be particularly concerned about with regard to vaccination? What's your, what's your take on that? Well, we sure need to be watching uh, surveillance, not just uh, in uh, the US, but across the world is crucial. And that a lot of that is now going on, although not probably as much as should be globally, especially in low and middle income countries where the technology just isn't available. Yeah, we want to watch and see if something is popping up that looks like it really might be a different kind of virus that would make us have to hit the reset button on our plans. So far, it hasn't happened. There was a buzz a bit about the variant called Mu, uh, which emerged in Colombia and Ecuador, South America. But it has not taken hold. Uh, in the US, there's less of it now than there was a month ago. So it doesn't seem to compete that well with Delta. And the data we have so far, and we have a very focused and rapid fire effort working collectively with industry to make sure we're checking. The data says that mu probably would be pretty well covered by the existing vaccines if it did manage to get a better foothold. So we're watching. I mean, this is something I look at every day uh, with a team uh, across the world that's tracking this and uh, anything that starts to look worrisome, we quickly jump on. WHO plays a huge role in this and they kind of decide when something is a variant of interest or a variant of concern and that kicks in a lot of other actions. So yeah, we need that surveillance and we're at risk because so many people are infected across the world and that's how variants arise <laughs> because this virus actually is pretty good at copying itself. It doesn't make mistakes that often, but with that many people infected, with that many viruses, even a low mutation rate means that things are going to be changing. And some have estimated that we're only maybe four or five mutations away from a virus that would evade our current vaccines. And that's not a happy thought. Uh, so we do need that surveillance and we need to be ready if something happens. So that's a, a very good segue into talking about getting people vaccinated. And this issue of vaccine hesitancy and what can we be doing? Uh, maybe we'll talk about it in the US context for the, this moment um, to really try to boost up uh, the number of people who are able and willing to be vaccinated. Now, I know that it's really the Pfizer vaccine that has full FDA approval. I think Moderna and J&J &J not quite yet. So I guess one question would be, where do we stand with that process? But then other things that you may be thinking about that, that should be uh, on our minds to try to increase the number of people who are vaccinated. Yeah. Well, Moderna has filed for full approval uh, in August. They got all their data in on that. So FDA is looking at that right now. J&J &J has not yet filed for full approval. That's probably still a couple months away. And there was some thought that maybe that was a significant reason for vaccine hesitancy. So we all watched closely when Pfizer got their full approval. And unfortunately, it didn't look like there was really much of a bump at that point. So while there may have been some people for whom that was rate limiting, I think most people had other concerns uh, that kept them from rolling up their sleeves. This is a serious and I must say somewhat unanticipated obstacle to getting this pandemic over with. In the United States, we have 70 million people who, despite the compelling evidence that's all been shared in public of safety and efficacy of any one of these three vaccines have yet to decide to roll up their sleeves. And I'm afraid they're barraged by all kinds of misinformation and some of it actually intentional disinformation that is rampant in social media and has caused people to be frightened about whether there are hidden risks here, that they're going to be made infertile, no evidence for that that they're gonna end up magnetic. Uh, that's another one, no evidence for that. Um, that this is uh, gonna put a chip into their system that will make it possible for somebody to follow them around. No, that's not happening. By the way, your phone is probably making that possible already, but that's another question. So all of this 
really, I don't think most of us thought would be such a major obstacle uh, to getting us to the point where we could start to drive this virus away. And now you see the tragedy around us, Kelly, in our country. We are losing 2,000 people every day, dying of COVID-19. The vast majority of those are unvaccinated and therefore are preventable. Those deaths did not need to happen. And yet somehow that message still isn't able to break through all of the concerns, uh, the fears that people have had instilled in their heads uh, by the information that's flying around uh, in irresponsible ways. And I'm pretty sympathetic with the people who are confused by all of that and who are hearing from their neighbors, say, I don't think I wanna do this. I am not sympathetic with the people who are spreading false information. Uh, they, they basically ought to think about what they're doing. This is not just a game, this is life and death. Yeah, so much more, much more work to come on that on that issue. Um, no question about it. I, I think what I'd like to ask you about now is switching gears just a little bit and talking about this condition called long COVID. Mm. So we are hearing about this um, long COVID situation, people who have persistent symptoms. Um, I understand the NIH is doing additional research on this topic. So we'd love to hear from you what you're all doing, what we should be imagining uh, for the future here, and are there treatments on the horizon or what, what, what could give us some hope in this issue? Well, I wish I could tell you more that I'm sure of. This is one more really troubling and surprising aspect uh, of COVID-19. Most respiratory viruses, after you get them, you might be pretty sick for a week or two, but if you start to get better, you just get better. With COVID-19, that is not the case for as many as 30% of people who have been infected. And that is really sort of unprecedented <clears throat> and we don't understand the mechanism. And this even happens to people who had pretty mild disease. It's not just the ones who were really sick in the hospital. So what's going on here? At the point that you have these lingering symptoms, you no longer harbor the virus in your nose and throat. We can't recover it in the usual way. So superficially, it doesn't look like this is somehow a chronic infection, but we couldn't rule out the possibility that there's not a reservoir somewhere uh, in your body of the virus because we can't sample everything. So that's one hypothesis. Another one for which there is some evidence is that this is an immune system overreaction uh, to SARS-CoV-2 and it can't seem to get itself back uh, to the normal reset. And that might then imply there's some things you ought to do uh, to try to achieve that. Um, and then maybe it's some other uh, initiation of a metabolic problem that similarly keeps you fatigued. You have brain fog, uh, palpitation, shortness of breath and inability in many instances to be able to go back to normal activities of school or work. So this is, this is a serious issue and this can linger on for weeks and weeks and weeks. So we've just started a cohort of over 30,000 COVID survivors, uh, some of whom already have long COVID, about half of them. Uh, the other half are people who are just acutely getting sick now and we wanna track and see what's the difference between the people who get long COVID and the people who don't, and then try to sort that out by looking at all the biomarkers that you could imagine to understand what is the pathogenesis. Because it's hard to design a clinical trial to help people or to prevent this if we don't understand what the cause is. This is a deep mystery and it's a deeply troubling one because if you think about the numbers, my goodness, uh, how many people in the United States have gotten infected with COVID-19 so far? Well, it's, uh, it's tens of millions. And if 10% of those individuals are ending up with long COVID, we have a huge burden here of chronic illness that we weren't planning on as part of a pandemic. So we got to work hard on this and we will. So Dr. Collins, can you just comment um, where vaccine fits in here? Are people who are vaccinated less likely to, let, to, to get long COVID or can you say anything about that? Yeah, recent data says if you got vaccinated and you ended up having a breakthrough case, which we are seeing more and more of, although happily most of those, the vast majority of them are relatively mild. That includes two of my granddaughters, by the way. 
uh, you can still get long COVID, but the likelihood is substantially lower. Um, I guess one message here is, if you want to avoid long COVID, get vaccinated. <laughs> first of all, you're much less likely to get COVID in the first place. And if you, even if you end up with a breakthrough case for which your likelihood is pretty low, uh, your chance of getting long COVID from that is also reduced. So maybe, I guess as we're talking about boosters now, maybe this ought to play into that as well, because uh, the expectation would be if you can avoid getting this illness by your initial immunization and your booster, that probably keeps you from falling into this group of folks who may be sick for weeks at a time. Yeah, that's a very good point. I guess we're in the latter part of September now, so we're sort of careening into flu season. Um, what do you think we should expect with regard to influenza and COVID, both potentially circulating at the same time? What are you imagining in terms of amounts of illness? And also, what are you saying about flu vaccine? Well, great questions, because we are coming into that season. Um, I run the National Institutes of Health. We have 45,000 employees and contractors um, who are now going to be required uh, to be vaccinated by November 22nd. But as in every year, we are also expecting them to get the flu vaccine because we do that too. We run a hospital. Uh, we want to be sure we're not doing anything that puts patients at risk. And I think that's uh, an important thing to keep in mind if people are trying to schedule any kind of immunization, don't forget your flu shot because uh, I don't see any reason why we would expect to have such an easy season like we did last year when everybody was masked and staying away from each other. We're doing less of that now. The flu is going to take advantage of that. So get your flu shot. And there's no reason you can't get your flu shot and your COVID booster on the same day if it turns out boosters are made available to you. So yeah, you can speed up the process of covering everything at once. Uh, there will also, of course, need to be a the kind of diagnostic testing available that doctor's offices and emergency rooms are gonna to have to depend on when somebody rolls in with respiratory symptoms and a fever. Well, is this flu or is it SARS-CoV-2? You're gonna to wanna to know. And so I'm happy to say a lot of those rapid response tests are now rolling out uh, to be able to make a answer available in a matter of 30 minutes or so. We're gonna need a lot of those tests. So, on that point, are we, would you need two tests to diagnose flu and COVID? Is that what we would need to do? Well, there's a multiplex approach, which is basically looking for evidence of the viral antigen. Um, and some of these are actually triplex, where they detect in the same nasal swab on a strip <clears throat> that has three different areas to give you the answer. One's for COVID, one's for flu A, and one's for flu B. And so you get the answer in one strip in 30 minutes or less, and that's going to be really valuable to sort things out in the emergency room. No question. Definitely of great value in the months ahead. No question. So, Dr. Collins, we have, I think, many parents and grandparents on the line with us today. And so they're all very anxious to know what they can expect with regard to children receiving COVID vaccines. So can you talk a little bit about timeline, what we might imagine would be occurring here in the US. I think we should talk about the US context for the moment. First for five to 11 year olds and then for the younger kids. What do you think? Well, for five to 11 year olds, Pfizer, again, a little ahead of Moderna on this, but not by much, uh, has already uh, in a press release uh, revealed the results of a trial on 2,268 kids uh, in that age group which looks really good. And, and what did they do? They basically assessed whether a one-third dose, because these kids are smaller than adults, a one-third dose, namely 10 micrograms instead of 30, would generate an antibody response that looks like it would be protective. And the antibody response they got was essentially equivalent to what you'd see with the full dose in a 16 to 25-year-old, just what you'd hope to see. And the side effect profile was entirely fine. Some sore arms, yeah, just like in the adults. That data is supposedly coming to FDA in the next week or so. Uh, FDA has announced that they're going to do 24-7 uh, going through it and, and do everything they can uh, to make a decision about approval, maybe as soon as Halloween. And I know a lot of parents will be very glad if that is the answer uh, for kids in that age group. 
But keep in mind, of course, that doesn't mean those kids go and get a shot and then there's no risk. You got to go through two shots, <laughs> three weeks apart, and then another two weeks after that. So if you got immunized on Halloween and you're, you know, nine years old, uh, it's still uh, going to be December uh, by the time you have that full protection. So realistically, in schools for the fall semester, we're going to have to depend on other means of mitigation which means the best thing you can do for those kids is actually be sure they're hanging out with other people who are immunized, their older siblings, uh, 12 to 17. Only half of 12 to 17 year olds have gotten immunized, which is a missed opportunity. And certainly their parents ought to be immunized and the teachers and the schools need to be immunized. And as unpopular as it is, wearing masks in schools, indoors, is clearly going to reduce the likelihood of outbreaks, which will drive those kids back home again, just when we're trying to keep them in school where they can have the benefits of that kind of learning experience. So could you um, comment on the younger children, those who are perhaps under five? That is underway. Um, and I understand those trials are going on and um, Pfizer expects uh, that the age group um, going down uh, to six months um, uh, will have data forthcoming to FDA later this year. But I don't know exactly what you what to predict about that timetable. Again, FDA will have to look at it. And obviously we want to be really careful uh, with little kids uh, to be sure we've got the dose right because they're not just miniature adults. Definitely, for sure. So switching gears again, let's talk about vaccines for a second. Since you're at the NIH and since you're sort of have your, um, you know, your hand on the pulse of what's going on, are there new strategies in the pipeline, new vaccines, new treatment modalities, anything new that we should know about? <laughs> Well, the U.S. government invested uh, as part of Operation Warp Speed in six uh, vaccines because we wanted to diversify, not knowing what was going to work and not really having the right to believe that they would work as well as they did. Oh, my gosh. When we got those messenger RNA vaccine results uh, showing 95 percent efficacy and a very good safety record, that was beyond oh, what almost any of us dared to hope for. So that's Pfizer and that's Moderna. Uh, then the, the viral vector ones, the adenovirus uh, vector ones, J&J &J getting approval. AstraZeneca has never really come forward for approval in the U.S., but it's obviously available in Europe and in the U.K. And then there are two vaccines that depend upon a purified protein subunit, basically purifying that spike protein and adding to it an adjuvant to kind of get the immune system to kick in. And one of those is Sanofi GSK, and one of those is Novavax. And neither of those have yet come forward to FDA, but I've, the Novavax phase three trial looked really good. Uh, the Santa Fe GSK trial is going on right now. So it would not be surprising if in the next few months uh, those also became available. Let's see what it looks like as far as safety and efficacy. More is better. More is better. There's no... No question about that. And I think ease of administration, ease of rolling out globally, I'm sure those are things you're thinking about. Absolutely. And you want something that is not going to be challenging in terms of its cold chain demand. Something that requires ultra low temperatures is not going to be easy to administer in a lot of parts of the world. There is effort also ongoing, although it's some distance away, uh, to develop vaccines that could be given by uh, basically a nasal spray uh, instead of requiring a needle. And obviously, that makes it even easier, but you got to be sure it's going to work. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Collins. It's been such a pleasure to have you here at this very important and very timely moment. And we, we also appreciate all who've tuned in today. You can follow Dr. Collins on Twitter at NIH Director, or you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Kelly Henning. And thank you again. Thanks, Kelly. It was great to talk to you.